um, I suppose some of you may already be familiar with Roche. Um, those of you who are not, um, we're a Swiss company. The, I think we're now classed as the world's largest biotech um, company after we bought a lot of shares back from Novartis. Um, 125 years, we, we just celebrated the history um, uh, of 125 years of Roche. 62.8 billion revenue, that uh, goes up and down depending on who you speak to, um, with 100,000 odd employees uh, globally. So Roche in itself is, is the business is split mainly in from, in from diagnostics and pharma. So diagnostics are the machines and the, the test kits and, um, you know, the, the scanners and all these things that, uh, you know, are supplied to healthcare centers, to hospitals um, and the like. Whereas obviously the pharma business is more on the on the drugs and um, all that kind of uh, the pharmaceutical business. However, so for, when I first... Um, so going back to me and when I was at uh, the Data Vault Summit and, and met Neil, the IT functions were still split accordingly. So we had IT for Dia and we had IT for Pharma. And um, I was leading up the, the data management um, and, and the data platforms for diagnostics, Roche Diagnostics. Now, since then, we've actually merged. We've gone through a... A transformation. It's called the IIX transformation. It's probably one of the biggest um, transformations that the Roche has ever seen, certainly on the IT side. And we've brought both IT for pharma and IT diagnostics together, and it's called One Informatics now. So suddenly, you know, what we delivered um, in terms of data mesh and, and data vault for, for diagnostics, which we've done very, very successfully, we are now starting the journey to roll this out for the whole of Roche. Yeah. And some of you who know Roche, the pharma business is, you know, I would say significantly bigger than the diagnostics um, business. And, you know, we have a lot more areas within, within pharma, certainly around the research areas, you know. Um, so this is exciting. It's a bit daunting. Our, our user base has suddenly, you know, gone tenfold. Um, we have to consolidate a lot of, certainly a, a lot around our tech stack. Um, as you probably know, in many companies, Roche is no different, that they have different platforms. They use every single technology that's out there in different areas of the business. And really our job now as one IT is to bring all this together, to consolidate, to save money, to reduce redundancies, um, and, and really you know, move forward as, a, as one analytics platform, focusing on this reusable data product um, concept, which I'll explain to you, um, which is the underlying principles of, of data mesh. So, Going back, I don't know, two years ago now, um, in Roche Diagnostics, when it started, we still had exactly the same problems as we've been having for years. Yeah, we had a centralized analytics team that were providing a monolithic, let's call it a data warehouse, data lake, lake house, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, we had one central IT team that was responsible for the tech, for the pipelines, ingesting the data, doing the transformations, doing the data modeling, and probably publishing it out to what, you know, information mart or data mart at the time um, for consumers to then consume either through a, a publication or through a direct consumption capability. Yep. And I'm sure you'll be very familiar with this. You know, this setup usually comes in a number of flavors. But it's all centered around the three, the typical three-tier architecture of ingestion, you know, transformations, um, and then out to consumption. Yeah, comes with governance, comes with some DQ, all the things that you 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 expect. Now we were no different. We we had individual teams: a team for ingestion, a team for transformations, a team for data mart or information mart, a governance team, a DQ team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and. This comes with all the, the pain points, as you can imagine. Um, it's it's a long, slow release cycle. I mean, I think it was one release every three months we did with this legacy platform architecture. You know, there was two, three major inc incidents, you know, probably per day 
<laughs> sometimes, but no, not per day. But uh, you know, usually per year, yeah, there'd be some really serious major incidents, and I'm talking serious, like you know that. Uh, the database somehow was corrupted, or the um, the pipeline was was significantly, you know, receivable, if you like. So, so they were all the the thing, and and actually, bot the the bottleneck was probably the main um, the the main complaint that that they had, because you would get all the teams that were using this data warehouse, Lake House, and you know they would come with different requirements. They wanted new sources to be ingested. They wanted new transformations to be done. They wanted, uh, you know, a, a migration of an old application to a new application. And then suddenly you were stuck with a huge backlog, you know, of things to do. And how do you prioritize that backlog? Yes, you have to get all the business owners together and prioritize, you know, what is the most important, what creates the most value, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, no different than all of the things that you're probably having with or without, uh, you know, a data um, data vault. So these things can happen either way. Now, so this is a, a favorite quote of my my then boss Omar Kavaja, and some of you may know Omar. You probably see him speaking, in, in behalf of of Rosh. He loves this quote that if you do the same thing over and over again, it's you know inspect different results. It's complete insanity, and this is what Rosh were trying to do. Yep, a few years ago, they thought, okay, we'll just move everything to the cloud. You know, we have unlimited space, unlimited processing power, things will be a lot better. Yep, clearly this is not the case. Yeah, you will still have the problems of backlog, priority, ownership. You still have the problem of actually IT don't really understand the data that they're modeling. Yeah, these are all things that will continue to exist, whether you data warehouse is on premise or on the cloud. So we uh, we sat down and Omar at the time came and said, you know, I've been reading this uh, blog about data mesh. Um, at that time, there was no book really, no, not too much material about it. And he said that maybe actually, you know, this could potentially help um, Roche in a way to deliver analytics you know, that was maybe um, a little bit new, a little bit um, dramatic, and, but maybe it could solve some of the problems that we were seeing that I explained to you. So, you know, we were all a little bit skeptical. 18 months ago, we'd heard of it, but yeah, we hadn't really understood what it would look like in practice. And, you know, let me explain to you about those of you, some of you will know obviously what data mesh is and have read the book and, and read a lot about it, but just I'll do a quick summary for those who don't. Um, and I find the middle one here, it's it's really probably are the best definition. You know, at its core, it's, a, it's founded in decentralization and distribution of responsibility to people who are closest to the data in order to support continuous change and scalability. So what it means is, you know, it's not something that we're trying to solve at IT here, we're, we're moving the, the responsibility and ownership of these things like code, like, you know, actually release cycles, ownership of consumption and um, serving up the data. We're moving that, that closer to the business. Yeah, the people that really understand what the data, they understand who needs to see the data and who doesn't need to see the data. They understand what they mean when they mean a, a consumer, a customer, instead of a, a hospital, for example, or a healthcare center or a doctor, you know, they really understand the differences between this. So this is really what it is. Yep, it's moving all this <clears throat> ownership, responsibility, packaged up in what they call a data product closer to the business, yeah. And here are the principles. It's not a methodology, it's, you know, they, they, they um, Jamak classes it as a paradigm, if you like, uh, and it's more of a mindset shift, a conceptual mindset shift. Yes, it has, you know, a lot more than that, but these are the four principles that she talks about in our book. You know, domain oriented ownership. We've talked about that, moving the ownership, yep, of a product to a domain, yep, and this domain is essentially a data domain, um, but it's closely aligned to what. Is known as a business domain, like some manufacturing or finance or commercial. These are domains 
you know, specified in, in at least in Roche. Yeah. Um, the data as a product is really the heart of it. Yeah, this is what we're delivering now, and this is what we're serving up for reuse. And you really need to think of this as a product. Yeah, it's not a project anymore. There's not a project team. It's a data product team delivering data product. And I'll speak a bit, bit more about what it means. You know the the characteristics of a data product, what the term actually means. Yeah, but think of it as something that you would publish to Amazon to be shopped for. Yeah, no different than that. Yeah. Um, so if you have that concept in your mind, it's it's a lot easier to then build around. Um, the self service data platform is is the tech part. Yeah. So us in IT, this is what how we can um, help this whole paradigm shift is we can build a self-service data platform to allow the data product teams to build and manage the life cycle of the data products. And this can, and I'll show you how we look at this in terms of services and capabilities, but we're not asking every domain to go ahead and just, you know, do what they want. It's not like we're giving them an AWS account for every domain and telling them to just go and get on with it. Yeah, we as a platform are building the capabilities, the interactions, the governance, um, not not the governance on an inception level, but the governance in terms of of IT governance, and we are supplying the prescriptive journey, you know, for these data product teams to make sure that they go from idealization to value to first MVP as quickly and effortly as possible. That's the the responsibility of the platform team, and I'll explain that to you a little bit in more detail. The federated data governance, this, the, the computational governance, sorry, this you know, is really understanding that we're not a central IT governance board anymore. It's not rule with authority. Yes, some things like, you know, global GDPR principles have to be clearly, but a lot of the governance needs to be put in the hands of the data product teams now, the data product owners. And these are the guys, like I said, that understand what policies need to be applied to a data product to allow the right people to see the right data. Yeah, and it, it happens at a number of levels and, and I'll explain this to you. But these products are useless on their own. Let me add, you know, they have to be interoperable, yeah, and they have to work together um, really to get this paradigm and get the success of data mesh. And it's, it's definitely not easy and I'll explain why uh, in a minute. So just on this product thinking, this is really the characteristics that I was talking about of our data product. And this is how we see, kind of takes the FAIR. I mean, I think you may be all familiar with FAIR principles, or FAIR data principles. It kind of takes that FAIR concept and just adds a little bit more characteristics around it. Um, so you can see here, you know, it, a data product has to have all these characteristics for us to classify it as a data product. Um, it has input ports and output ports. This is the, the way that the data flows in. Yep. And the consumption of a data product can only be through an output port. You cannot consume a data product directly from a, you know, just in a table, for example, that is not part of a data product. There is an output port, which may be a JDBC connection to the data product. It may be a, a an API for a data product. Um, it can also, if it's a, if the data product essentially is a Tableau report, yeah, so the, the data pipeline is there within the data product and the output port is a Tableau report, then that can equally be an output port for consumption, yeah. So just to kind of give you that idea there. Um, and uh, the federated governance, um, a bit more detail about this, this kind of goes into two, uh, three different levels. We have a cross-domain federated uh, governance board, which is mainly the domain owners yeah, get together every week. We have this every Friday at Roche. Uh, get together and understand what they need in place to, make, to manage the Roche data mesh. So, for example, an asset model, a data product asset model, you know, that you know defines the relationships between the the attributes and the assets, then it would be pretty pointless to have different asset models for every domain or even every data product. You know, to really get the value of a Roche data mesh, you need to agree at this cross-domain level a a single unified asset model. And similar to legal and compliance, like GDPR, 
they have policies. They need to, I think there's someone maybe not on mute here, but anyway, okay, maybe that's better. Um, and then we have the governance at the domain level. So every domain really needs to govern their data products. Yep, accordance to the, the, the data mesh governance policies. And they need to set their stall out and you cannot really do this. And this is what I mean by I can't do this just from IT because the domains need to drive this at the domain level. And you know, a domain owner is essentially usually a business um, a business owner, not IT. Um, and, and we are supporting this in terms of, at Roche we support you know, many ways, including funding, because a lot of the business give the money to IT to deliver analytics to them, yeah, basically the best way that they can. So, you know, we, we provide the tech, the architecture, the best practice, the guidance and the support, but really we cannot drive, you know, at a domain level, the success of a data mesh approach. This, and, and, you know, I need to be clear about this. A lot of companies have tried to do this from IT and have failed miserably, yeah, because they have not got the buy-in from the business. The business are like, no, you know, why should I buy into this? It brings no value to me. And if, you know, if you're not aligned there and moving in the same direction, then this will, you know, it's a non-starter. So, and this is a summary of what I mean about the shifts, yeah. So, you know, governance is a shift from top down to more of a bottom up um, federated approach. We have a shift from more of a monolithic style to more of a distributed architecture. We have a shift from centralized ownership to the domain ownership. And, you know, a lot of these other shifts that you see on the screen here. So a lot of it is a mindset, yeah? It's shifts in ways of working, shifts in ownership, shifts in mindset. So I was speaking to Philip Morris International today, actually, and they were struggling really with this. Yeah, they, they were absolutely confident they could do this from IT, but they were really struggling with this mindset shift. And they need, you know, they were asking for advice, how Roche really managed um, to do this. And I'm not saying we have done it fully yet. Yeah, but we are still, you know, early on in our data mesh journey. But what I would say is, you, you know, look for these, these two domains, if you like, two or three domains, start small, even if it's one domain, yeah. You start small, get the buy-in from this domain and then work with this domain as IT, up as a, a really cross-functional data product team. Work with this to get the value that, you know, of a real of a real high value data product use case. And once you get that buy-in from maybe one or two domains, that, you know, it starts, the, the, the snowball starts to go. Other people become interested. They want to start, they see the value that maybe manufacturing have, have gained, and then they start to, to come on board and they want to start working, you know, what, how can I get on the data mesh? What do I need to do? You know, is my domain mature enough, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this would be my advice to, to start small and really get some good, high value, successful use cases um, on the data mesh. So, and, and this is the maturity model that I, talk, I talked about. Um, this is the journey that we went through and everybody, every each domain goes through, you know, to really to find out how mature they are in terms of, are they ready, you know, to be data product owners? Are they ready to be on the data mesh as part of the data mesh? Do they understand about reusability? Do they understand that once they publish this product, you know, for other people to use in other domains, you know, they're responsible for it. You cannot just publish a product and leave it, yeah? So I would recommend also to go through this maturity model before you even, uh, before you start. Um, I wanna just kind of shift more towards the tech and this kind of is leading up to the to the the, the data vault part, um, and this is what is explained in the book. Yeah, what the the architecture looks. This is kind of the distributed architecture approach. More at this, you know, in the middle. It's kind of like I hear it sometimes referred to as a as a hamburger, where you have the the, the two patties and the meat in the middle here. But, um, uh, you know, you've got your overarching data governance, which I've, I've talked about. Yeah, this is important to set standards, to set ways of working, to set rules about how we interact with each domain, 
you know, how we reuse other data products, how we can request enhancements to a data product, et cetera, et cetera. You also need at the bottom this self-service data platform, which I'll explain to you in more detail in a minute. And then you have the domain ownership at the, at the center. And each domain has to be, you know, really autonomous for their own success. They have to be able to, you know, self-serve their own needs to build up and manage their own data products. Um, so let me start. We started February 2001. Uh, started thinking really about data mesh. We had one first use case. It was it was CX Insights, which was Customer Insights. Um, they wanted to build a. Well, we didn't really understand it was a data product at that time, so we built it in our you know conventional way. We 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 were being we had been using Data Vault for quite a while already, and. Of course, we had this one use case. We brought in the ingestion, the, the data sources. At that time, we used Talent, GitLab, and I think we had an Ubuntu runner to do our release um, cycle and our promotions. We ingested it in. We did our modeling uh, with Data Vault and out to a Data Mart. Yeah, and then we would connect to it with Tableau um, or maybe a custom application built in AWS. And that was really our first, it was our first movement from our on premise analytics platform to the cloud yep using snowflake as our underlying technology um, to build up our ecosystem on um, and then we kind of moved to start you know the more and more we started learning about data mesh we we more we understood we need a lot more capabilities so we started um you know working with uh data ops which uh, kent i see is on the call um and you know we, we spoke to kent and the data ops team early on because we understood that if we were go moving towards this distributed architecture you, you know we needed something very easy for these vanilla developers to use within the, the data product teams so that they didn't really have to build up some ci cd pipeline on their own they didn't have to you know understand how to promote their code uh, with all the you know the core capabilities. We needed something for the vanilla developer to come in and manage this release cycle data ops process without having the expertise you would expect from a, a hardcore DevOps engineer. Yeah. Um, so this was the, one of the very first capabilities we, we brought in. And then we started bringing other capabilities in. At that time, we brought, uh, we started using Snowpipe for our ingestion. Um, we, we we integrated ThoughtSpot um, and Tableau, a little bit of Altrix because it was there for the, the data science guys. Um, and then we started integrating some of the, the AWS services such as SageMaker. Um, obviously we needed some EC2 to host, you know, the data ops runners, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, this was the build up, starting to make the build up of the capabilities. And then this is kind of how it looks today, you know, fully, on board, bought into the, the, the data mesh principles. Um, and we've upped our capabilities with things like access control with Amuta, monitoring with Monte Carlo, data science workbench with data IQ. Um, we have, we use Calibra for our um, data catalog and our our, um, our governance when it comes to, to metadata of about containing our data product metadata. Uh, we have a, a shopping portal. We call it the, the Roche Data Marketplace, where you know people go to consume uh, data products or publish data products too, and they're all integrated through our self-service data platform team. Yep, and it is very it is a very prescriptive approach, and this is how we look at our platform. Yeah, we look at it in terms of services, capabilities, and integrations. So when we first speak to our stakeholders, we do not talk about tech and Snowflake and data ops and the Muta and all these things. We really understand their use case and what capabilities and services they need for their use case. And this results in, in what you see here. You know, they tell us what service they want to use for the use case, we will say, okay, we have an integrated capability already for this. This is perfect. Or it might be missing and we have to go and build. And the bottom here, this is what we call mostly our products. Yeah. So this will be, for example, um, our talent um, ingestion uh, fabric, our talent data fabric product. 
and we will build an in integration between Talend and maybe DataOps. Yeah, the DataOps here is maybe another product. And we as a platform team will build those integrations. Maybe one might be Calibra, the integration to publish the metadata um, you know, into Calibra. So the lines are the integrations and the circles we think as our products from our product stack. Um, and this is what I mean about more of a prescriptive way. This is just another view, but more of a, a prescriptive way how people are, are usually once they are onboarded, they have their, their, uh, their, their data product use case, they come in, we onboard them in more of a discovery workshop, then they move to the technical onboarding. We then take them through the, the capabilities that they will need for that particular use case they may or may not need. Um, and then we, we actually take their developers through the journey of this. This is how, you know, you need to build and manage a data product. It needs to have, you know, these characteristics. It needs to have fitness and SLOs and SLIs. And this is how, you know, you you define them. And actually, this is how you measure them. Yeah, this is how you share your data. This is how you make sure, you know, that your data quality is of quality. Yeah, and it is a prescriptive journey. We are not telling everybody, here's an AWS account, get on with it. Use whatever you want. Yeah, this would be the Wild West. It would be absolute chaos. And, you know, we would have some data products that were excellent and some that were really shit. So, and again, this is a different view, more aligned to the data mesh. I told about capabilities and services. We look at the capabilities on the different planes of the data mesh, you know, the experience plane, the product, which is the developer plane and the infrastructure plane. And we have the different personas. Um, we think of it as data providers, governance members, and data consumers. Each of these personas will need different services. And it's up to us to then translate those services into configurable integrations to the tech stack for the developers to work with. I'll give you a quick example. How am I doing for time? Okay, not so so good for time, but I'll give you a quick example. This is, um, you know, how, you know, a data, um, you yeah, know, let me see this one. Oh, going back. Sorry. This is how a, um, a consumer will request um, access to a data product. So this is a screenshot of the Roche Data Marketplace. They'll, they'll found their data product. This one's called One Ring Sales. They want to request access for it. For So that's all they need to know. Yeah, I mean, they all they want to do is find it and request access to it. Now we have to build in an automated process to enable this at the platform level. And this is kind of, I'm not expecting you to read too much into this, but you can see this is what the process looks like from a technical workflow. Yeah, And we have this mapped out and defined for every service that we will need on the data mesh platform. Yeah, And one of those might be, you know, I want to model my, my data in a data vault. And this service, you know, is something that a developer will want to do clearly and we will build a technical workflow to say to all, so all that they will have to do is hopefully integrate with the capabilities the best practices the frameworks that have already been provided by the, the self-service platform team so let's move on to more specific data vault modeling so in the early days yes this is how it looked I have already explained this to you. We had a central IT team. We had a split between dev and ops. And, you know, we had different teams doing different things like reporting, consuming. We had, you know, BI teams at, at every affiliate, um, data science teams um, doing, doing this. And, you know, this is how it looked in terms of a data flow. And you're all probably quite familiar. We have, we call our, our landing or our staging area, our persisting staging, it's PSA. The data essentially comes in there and then gets you know, modeled into the raw data vault and into the business data vault and then output to information marts or, or data marts. Um, and the ownership pretty much was all done by the one central IT team. So you can see the ownership colors at the bottom there. This then, you know, was great because it does you know, contain a team of very highly skilled data engineers, developers, analysts, data modelers, yep, that you can contain. They all know what each other's doing and it's very slick. However, releases are slow. There's a huge backlog, you know, business demands 
you know, things to move a lot quicker than they do. So we then move to more of this data product approach where we have different data product teams aligning to a data domain team. And then each of these data domain teams um, line to this cross domain governance board. Yep. And this is kind of how it looks like in the data mesh world at Roche now today that these data product teams are cross-functional and um, they will contain business members and IT members. So, you know, a typical data product team will have an architect, um, they will have a data product manager, a data product owner, um, they may have a governance lead, um, they may have a team of three or four developers, um, you know, data engineers, in that data product team. Yep. Some of them are huge teams. Well, I say huge, but like maybe 10, 15 people and others are maybe three or four, I think is probably the minimum that we have in a data product team. Um, but you, you know, that is really the distribution. Now you will have the skills yep, and the autonomy to do exactly what you want whenever you want in your own data product team. Yeah. So then th this is what, what we moved to then after this. We still, we, we had a kind of intermediary stage where we still did all the ingestion. Yeah. So we had a, we had a central talent team that did a bit of talent and some real time ingestion and some, some other ingestion using snow, snow pipe as well. So we, we kept that for a while. Um, and then the data product teams, all they had to do was focus on the data modeling um, and the, the, then the, the business uh, transactions, the, the business rules when it came to the, the data market. Yeah. We then moved away from that. And then each data product team became responsible also for the ingestion of their, now, you know, the, what I would say is that their source that was, that was owned by their domain. Now this becomes a little bit tricky when you have a, a source as maybe an ERP system that crosses between manufacturing and maybe finance, for example. Yeah, but then it, it becomes a little bit more tricky, but uh, you know, uh, that's for another day. I can, <laughs> anyone who wants to know how we solve that, um, I can tell you. But essentially what the, the message is here that is that every data product team were responsible for the end-to-end -end build of their data product. Now we thought in the early days, um, that, okay, yeah, our data vault is good. No, so, so satellites are good. They can all have their own satellites and be responsible, but, but we, we kind of want single hubs. So we thought, well, we would have cross ownership for the hubs, like the customer hub, the product hub, et cetera. We tried this, yeah, it does not work. Yeah, you cannot have an, a data mesh implementation like cross ownership of anything, yeah, in a data product. And this really, I would not, if you're thinking this, please do not do this. Yeah. Um, it, it's just chaos. You cannot have other teams writing into to other um, into hubs that other data product teams are also relying on. Okay. So yes, I mean, the pros and cons are there. You know, there's, it's getting better, but it's still not, um, you know, 100% data mesh in this world. So what do we now that do, and this is kind of the current state today, is that we, you know, really have this autonomous data product team that are responsible for building, you know, their data vault model. And, and in some cases, you know, um, teams are, I would say, have decided not to apply, you know, the, the full data vault methodology. And, and this is okay, yeah, because what we're happening, what, what, what we're finding now is that it's distributed. You've got to think about your data vault artifacts also as products, yeah? And if you want these data vault artifacts to be reused, yes, they're invaluable for your data product, but actually they could be invaluable for other people's data product. So there's another domain that, that's using the data vault methodology. They also have a customer hub. Um, yep, you have a customer hub for your particular use case for your data product that you want to use. And by publish them as them as data products, 
you can have this master data customer, master data product, yeah, that the, the other team, let's say another, another data product team that has full autonomy and ownership says, okay, I'm going to build a master data customer data product out of all these autonomous um, satellites or hubs or whatever they want to use. And this is the only way that it can work to have this full autonomy, this ownership, this publishment of reuse, and obviously reuse, there has to be interoperability. And this is what's brilliant about a data vault, because you're providing a natural business key. You're not providing a unique ID to a SAP system or a Salesforce system. You're providing an interoperable, you know, a natural business key for everyone to use. So think about it as, you know, a maybe a customer retention um, data product, yep, is your end result that you're using. You publish that data product, now the data set, yep, under there is clearly a mix of your end result, which is ready for consumption, but it also includes with that your satellites and your hubs that you've used for that end result, and it's available for now for people to use in their data vault model if they have one. Yeah. So this is how we look at it now. You know, it takes a little bit of thinking to get your mind around this. And, and initially you would think it completely goes against the data vault methodology. And and last uh, May in Stowe, Dan and I had lunch and we were talking, you know, in, in depth. I think it was about a three hour lunch in the end uh, about, you know, this concept. This is and about this distributed data vault model. And it's not just a distributed model, but it's a distributed ownership. Yep, you're you're having distribute these different artifacts owned by different teams. And he said that he actually did this. He doesn't write about it in his book um, because it it just adds this huge level of complexity. But he had to do this in certain use cases. And he talked about, for example, data residency. Some customers could not leave, you know, a a uh, a database in China, for example, yeah, and some customers could not leave a database in Switzerland or America. Now, you know, you you then have the ownership of these separate these separate artifacts, and together as a whole, maybe using a like as table in 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 the business data vault, you put some kind of conceptual data product on the top of that. Yeah, so it's not new, you know, um, but actually implementing it. And getting that you know that that mindset shift around ownership takes a little bit of getting used to, yeah. Now, data products in general, yes, I mean, there is some some issues that we're facing, and and everybody's facing at the moment is the reluctance to own data products, and and this is people that are asking this question: is, okay, so why should I build a nice data product for reuse for other people to use? If I'm not getting any benefit out of of this at all, it just it's just causing me more hassle and more work, yeah. And this is this is true. We have to find an incentive for data product owners to publish their data and to maintain the quality of their data that it's fit for purpose. This I would say is the biggest biggest I wouldn't say problem, but the biggest challenge that we're having right now in Roche. Yeah, and we're trying to think of ways to solve this, like so maybe they get more budget yeah in their in their particular domain the more data products they publish yep and that are fit for 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 reuse yep so maybe that's the way they get more it budget for it so this is something that we're seriously thinking about but there has to be something else you know the data owners will be reluctant to publish them um so this is kind of the example that I explained. Yeah, so you have different teams um, publishing different data products, and then in the mesh scenario, you're having, you know, different data, different data product teams can use all these data products, bring them together to create new data products, and this is how the mesh will work, and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the more you have on your mesh, the easier and the more mature and the quicker time to market the quicker value that you have so let me skip through this and just show you what we are where we are just now and i'll hopefully leave some time for questions is this is um really a state of play 
you know, we started February 2021. Um, we've brought the average MVP time, MVP time down, you know, from about six months to six to eight weeks. And I can guarantee you this will only get quicker. There are more and more data products that are published and ready for reuse, then the quicker the actual new time to value for a data product will come down. Yeah. And we want to get to the point where actually teams are getting instant value from these data products. And you know, they don't have to bring in new data sources. They can they can bring a data product with another data product in a marketplace, combine it together to get instant value. Yeah. Um, and this is my kind of my vision North Star for next year to really to try and make this happen. I've got about 330 data products um, published and that are fit for, for reusability. We're just going through a governance process just now to actually uh, qualify a data product or certify a data product. There are certain criteria that it measures. If it's not fit, if it does not have the quality, if it does not have the SLOs or SLIs that measure the SLOs in place, then we do not certify it. Yeah, And this is part of the overall governance of a data mesh. Anybody can call their data, rename their data sets, data products. Yeah, I mean, and say, okay, yeah, we have a data mesh now, but actually, you know, you need to put that governance in to certify these data products and make sure they're actually fit for, for repurpose, you know, for reusability. Um, we have about 50 data product teams in about 20 domains on, on the, the data mesh at Roche, about 2,600 users, um, you know, we're up to about 20, 220 to releases last month. This was because I, I actually looked at this the other day just to update the figures here. And I was um, actually surprised because the old figure says 110, I think, releases. And and actually, we've we've changed our approach to force people to use data ops. And Kent will love this uh, news. But um, really, you know, we are saying you cannot publish anything now in production without you know, going through the proper release process and data ops. And people are loving it now because they can release whenever and whenever they want, even just a small table change or a name change, they're using data ops to release it in seconds, yeah? And this is really, you know, it's, it's, it's massive. That's a huge, impressive number. And saving millions, I mean, really, honestly, uh, people are measuring the, the, the value of the data products now in the domains. And this is the hardest bit to do is to measure the value. What you want to get to a point is where you have valuable, this is how much value we're getting from it. And this is how much it takes to cost or how much it costs to build a data product. And you want to offset that against the ones you want to decommission, the ones you want to improve and keep. And it's a whole journey and life cycle. We're not quite there yet in putting a, a def definitive value on every data product but we're certainly getting there, yeah. And maybe eventually we want to monetize our data products. I'm not sure, yeah, in Roche, most of them, you know, you know, will be pretty sensitive, but maybe there is some information around the, the research data products that we will want to monetize and sell on the, on the exchange.